All right. And I think, I'm not sure if anybody's coming in person, but even um, people who, uh, who want to come in person get lazy. It seems like going on Zoom is uh, an easy way to study, which is fine. I think I, I have a feeling that the Zoom is here to stay. Okay, and then I'm going to record this. Do, do, do. Okay, there we go. Alrighty, so um, I think we're going to get started over here. And um, nice little intimate group. So it's going to be uh, a wonderful class where we can share uh, ideas on this uh, topic, which is uh, an interesting topic. And the, um, the course is called It Can Happen. And I know that many of you received the flyers and, if, and some people call me up and says, Rabbi, what the heck is this? What do you mean it can happen? What can happen? Where, where is it going to happen? And uh, people didn't put two in. It was hard to really to understand what, what, what the flyer was all about. But it, it really is, in a nutshell, the concept of the Mashiach, how Judaism understands the end of times. Now, you know, when you use the word of end of times, many people think about the apocalypse. You know, people think about, you know, doomsday, that kind of stuff. But when we speak about the Mashiach, we are not talking about that at all. We are actually referring to a time where the world will come into perfection. We're going to come into a time where divine transparency um, will be right before us, meaning that you know today we, we have doubts and we have questions and we're not sure and we don't know and we disagree and we philosophize, but there'll be that clarity about the world. There'll be clarity about our souls. There'll be clarity about everything that happens in this world. Um, and that idea will, will uh, come out as we continue to discuss these ideas throughout the next six weeks. But one of the, oh, excuse me, one of the important things that we have to understand is that this topic, let's say even 100 years ago, Jewish people might have not had the luxury to have this discussion. And there were various reasons for that. I believe the primary reason was, um, which was you know, over almost uh, 2000 years old, and that is that um, Christianity, um, they have proclaimed that the Mashiach has already arrived. And the Jewish people said that he has not arrived. So that was a very significant dispute amongst humanity, amongst Jewish people versus those people who believe that he already came. So it's like, you know, people joke around. They say, okay, just let him come. And if he says it's, you know, it's my second time here, we'll be wrong. Jewish people will be wrong. If he says it's my first time that I'm coming, that I'm here, then we'll know that Judaism was right. So let him come. All right. So that's, that's a nice idea to say, let the Mashiach come and then we'll figure it out. Um, but, a, but another, and, and by the way, that, that costs a, a lot of lives amongst the Jewish people. Um, people... Uh, Jewish people were forced into these debates, not only about the Mashiach, about Judaism versus Christianity, the understanding of God, the understanding of uh, the covenant between the Jews and, and God, and perhaps new covenants that God would make with other nations. So the idea of Mashiach came uh, as a great difficult, difficulty for Jewish people to have a discussion about. Another idea is, which we'll talk about at, at another point in the, in the course, and that is the idea that there were false Mashiachs, false messiahs that proclaimed themselves as the Messiah, and it never, ever turned out well. It always turned into chaos, into havoc, and really total destruction amongst the Jewish people. The most famous uh, false Mashiach is um, Shabtai Tzvi. We won't get, we're, we're going to talk about false messiahs at another point, but the Shabtai Tzvi perhaps is the most famous one in the 17th century, caused tremendous amount of havoc in, in Eastern Europe. And then he moved to Israel and uh, he was uh, taken as a prisoner by the Ottoman Empire who were Muslims. And they forced, well, we're not sure. He did ultimately convert to, to um, Islam. Some Jewish people still believed in him and said, he's got to go through this transformation until the Mashiach comes. But nevertheless, it was a total disaster. So Speaking about, uh, not speaking about Mashiach was just convenient. Um, it always caused problems. It was very difficult. But thank God we find ourselves in a time 
where we have no danger, there is no danger in speaking objectively about the Mashiach. Of course, there's danger. You know, uh, I was joking around with people. I said, two things can happen in this course. Either I'm going to proclaim myself as the Mashiach. So either I'll be a crazy guy proclaiming myself as the Mashiach. And that's quite fun. Imagine sitting for six weeks with this crazy man uh, proclaiming himself the Mashiach. You know, it, it'll be quite interesting. It'll be very entertaining. Or I can bore you and be the real Mashiach. And then you actually not bore you. you. You'd be very excited to find that, that you were the first ones to, um, uh, to hear about the proclamation about the Mashiach. So all kidding aside, we do live in a time where we have the luxury. And in fact, it, we probably should go back to the discussion about the Mashiach. Um, and again, I want to I wanna reemphasize that when we speak about the Mashiach, it's not about the end of days in that there will be total annihilation of humanity. The world will come to its end, the apocalypse, the gloom. That's not what we are talking about. Um, we're talking about that perfection, the healing, and the transparency of God. Um, in general, when we talk about Judaism, Judaism has lots of beliefs. You know, we can sit here all day long. We can have a course on the beliefs uh, that Jewish that Judaism has about God, about the world, about the Torah, about the soul, about the afterlife. There's a million and one things that we can discuss. Um, you know, a, a primary belief that we have is every Shabbat we celebrate the creation of the world, that God created the world in six days and he rested on the seventh day. Uh, so that's a big belief. We have a belief that God uh, gave us the land of Israel and the land of Israel is the most sacred of all lands. Is the dirt and stones of Israel, the earth and stones of Israel different than the stones of uh I don't know, Utah. So, uh, you know, it's a belief. And those are fundamental beliefs because look at the sacrifice we have for the land of Israel. Look at the sacrifice we have to observe the Shabbat. Look at the sacrifice for the Torah. We believe that God gave us the Torah and we have to observe it. So we have a lot of sac sacrifice for that. But here's something very interesting. If you look at the Rambam, Maimonides, and, and this is not sourced in, it's not originally, it doesn't originate from Maimonides, but we talk about the 13 principles of faith. So it's not 13 principles of beliefs, but they are 13 principles of faith. And Maimonides has, in Maimonides lists those 13 principles, and he pretty much distills them and explains them. Um, later on, I'm not sure at, at what period who did it, but they made each one of those principles, the principles of faith, into very short sentences. And they used the word in Hebrew, ani ma'amin, I believe, be'amunah, Mashiach in the coming and the arrival of the Mashiach, be'amunah shalema, with complete faith. Um, so those are principled faiths that we have. These are the things that we must believe in. And if you read Maimonides, he talks about how if a person doesn't believe in them, it's possible that they're denying the whole Torah, they're denying that, uh, that Moses existed even, that Moses was a prophet, so on and so forth. But these are very, very important fundamental beliefs that a Jewish person has to have. And if you look at the last two of those principles uh, or principled uh, 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 beliefs or faith, they are, ooh, one second, I think somebody's trying to come in and he didn't get... Hold on one second here. Yeah. Waiting to be in the Zoom. Okay. Got him in. Okay. Sorry about that. Somebody texted me that I didn't let them in. I got them in. Alrighty. Sorry about that. Okay. So, uh, Ellie, I want to welcome you. Sorry that I I uh, I wasn't looking at the board. Welcome. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. So we just started. You yeah you, you you didn't really miss much. We're getting right into the swing of things. All right, so back to the idea of the 13 principles of faith, which is fundamental to um, Judaism and to the Jewish people. This is something that we must believe in. And if you're having a hard time having faith in those 13 principles, one has to study them and one has to ask questions about them and work on those 13 principles. But we're not going to talk about the 13 principles in this course. What we are going to talk about is we are specifically going to speak about the last two uh, principles which deal with the coming of Mashiach. So uh, the belief in the future redemption uh, occupies what seems to be a disproportionate amount of space 
in the very core of the traditional Jewish belief system, the coming of the Mashiach, which are two of those animamins, two of those pieces of belief, uh, plays a very integral and very important part of our belief system. So that, that's very important for us to understand. And that's why we are going to be discussing uh, the topic of Mashiach. Now, um, if you look about, if you look historically, uh, Jewish people have, are probably, not probably, they were, not now, but they were for thousands of years, the most persecuted people that ever existed. That's true. You know, if not for, you know, certain events that took place in the world and in, in current times, like the United States of America, it's very possible that there would be some kind of, kind of other persecution, whether it be in other continents and other countries where Jewish people would, would be persecuted. And that would not be a very, very good thing, obviously. So we are glad that we're living in this time. But you look historically, and not too far back, if you look at the World War II, you're talking about the Holocaust. Over 6 million Jewish people were killed in my own family. Um, you know, all of my, most of my great uncles and aunts and grandparents and great grandparents and even great, great grandparents, because I'm named after my great, great grandfather. My first name is Yitzchak. And that name is after a, a great, great grandfather who passed away. His name was Yitzhak Luxemburg. That was my grandfather's, my mother's father's fa uh, grandfather. And my second name is Yisrael, Israel, which was named after my great uncle, my grandfather's brother. So, you know, persecution um, and annihilation, the attempt of an annihilation of the Jewish people exists, you know, in our time today. Meaning not that it's happening today, but we're not that removed from the generation that experienced those uh, persecutions. So you have to ask yourself a question, you know, so how did the Jewish people cope? I mean, what was the mechanism that they were able to say, you know what, um, we're gonna overcome this and there's gonna be hope in the future. You look at the concentration camps, I'm not saying everybody, but there were people that were able to um, count on the idea that the war would end, things would become better, there will be, there will be a better time. So we can philosophize from today till tomorrow as to what, what was the thing that motivated the Jewish people um, in a concentration camp or in any a kind of situation of persecution. What was the thing that they clung onto? What were they clinging onto that led them to believe that there would be a better time? So I believe that probably it was the belief in the coming of Mashiach. They truly believe that there will be a time when uh, when when the Mashiach would come and Mashiach would uh, eventually redeem the Jews and all of humanity from all of the suffering of and ills of this world. That's what the Mashiach would do. And this happened in almost, in not almost, in every single generation. Jewish people relied on the concept that the Mashiach would come. So maybe now we live in so much luxury as we're going to learn in, in this class. We live in, a, in one of the, probably the best times ever. And if we're living in the best times ever, people can say to themselves, so maybe I don't really need Mashiach. But what I'm going to, what, what I'd like to do right now is I want to show you for a moment, I'm going to share with you a beautiful video that I, I dug, somebody sent it to me. And this is the uh, uh, a video of Elie Wiesel, who is probably one of the most, probably the most famous Holocaust survivors, survivor. Um, and he actually sings the song of the 12th principle of the belief in the coming of the Mashiach. And in Hebrew, the words are Ani Mamin, Be'amun HaShalema, Be'viyat HaMashiach. So here, I'm going to share that with you right now. So give me one second. Um, hope we get it right. <laughs> here it is. Just, just to show you, to get a little sense of what it means. Okay, here we go.
Okay. Anyhow, that was uh, Ali Wiesel singing the, these words of the belief in the coming of Mashiach. And those are the words that we are going to read right now. So everybody take your uh, books, your student books, and please turn to page number three. I have the feeling that some of you do not have a, a book. If you are savvy enough and technical enough, you can find the book on our website. You can download it. Well, it's not the book, just the first lesson, but I will get out a, a book to those who don't have one, if, if you need one. And if you go to jewishpv.com forward slash Zoom, and then click on the Zoom class for JLI, you will see a link for a PDF for this lesson. So you can download it. So page number three, text number one, here we go. Uh, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Mashiach, although he may tarry, I await his arrival every day. This is the 12th principle of faith. We are supposed to believe in this all the days of our life. Now, Maimonides is not the one who created this idea. He would never do anything like that. Every law that Maimonides codifies in the book called Mishnah Torah is based on Talmud and based on verses from the Torah. So when it comes to the ideas of Mashiach, in the five books of the Torah, it's more hinted there. But if you want to see the way the Torah explicitly, explicitly speaks about the idea of Mashiach, you really have to go into the books of the prophets. And we're, gonna, we're, going, we're going to quote a few verses from the books of the prophets, and we will see what we are talking about when we uh, speak about the Mashiach. In this course, I just want to give you a heads up that in this course, we're going to cover ideas such as what does the what what does the Jewish version of the redemption look like? So what does the Mashiach look like? It is, is it the dooms and glooms day, as some people predict? Or is it you know some kind of utopian time? Another idea is what is the source of this belief? So, you know, how do where, where does it come from? You know, people say, show me where it is in the Torah. How realist, realistic is this belief? That's a big question. People say, can it really happen? How vital is this belief? You know, maybe I don't really have to deal with it. You know, I, I can keep Shabbat. I can put on tefillin. I can be kind to other people. I'm willing to give loans. I'm willing to help. But I'm not sure that it's so important in my life. If the Mashiach comes, that's great. Um, do we even need the redemption today? You know, that's another question. You know, we're living in fantastic times. Do we actually need uh, the Mashiach? So during this course, we are going to touch upon ideas that are on the physical realm and the physical dimension and ideas that are in the spiritual dimension. Today, in our course, we're going to speak about our, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, we're going to speak about what's going on in our world today, where we stand in our world today. So we're going to deal with the physical dimension. But next week and in other weeks, we are going to have to deal with the spiritual dimension of understanding of what the Mashiach is going to add into our lives and what it's gonna add into this universe. So there are spiritual dimensions that we're gonna talk about and there's also the physical dimension. Today, we're gonna to focus more on the state of affairs of, of the world today. So that will be the physical dimension that we're gonna speak about. In Hebrew, um, there is a word for the status that we find ourselves in now. We believe that we are now in what we call Galut or Gola. Gola means exile. After the second temple was destroyed, the Jewish people are considered to be in Gola. We are in exile. And by the way, in modern day today, if Israelis, when someone leaves Israel, whether they leave permanently or they go just temporarily and they're going to anywhere outside of Israel, they're saying they're going to the Gola. Gola means in exile. And Israel is considered sort of not the Gola. But the truth is, today, even Israel is in the Gola. The fact that we don't have the rebuilding of the third temple, the fact that Israel is in constant um, a threat by its neighbors, and hopefully it's getting better, but still there's a threat against Jews and, is and, and, and Israel, um, the, go the Gola, the actual redemption has not arrived. So the word Gola means exile the state in which we find ourselves now. But if you want to use the word for when Mashiach comes, it's called Geula, which means that you add one letter and that is the letter Aleph. So you go, you take the word Gola, exile, and add a letter Aleph, which would be in English, I guess, the equivalent of the letter A, and now you have redemption. So 
there really isn't a very big difference in the spelling of the, of the word, in the pronunciation of the word between exile and redemption. Gola, geula, which means that they are both, they are both the same thing, but something has to change to transform the gola, the exile, into geula, into redemption. And perhaps we are ultimately always on the path. We're marching forward to that time where we have the geula, the redemption. So what is geula? What does redemption mean? Redemption means it is a time where the purpose of creation is transparent. We understand why God created the world, this universe, and what we're supposed to do here. Most of us are in this world and we're paying our bills, we're raising our families, we're competing, whether it's in business, whether it's in, in personal things, we're doing a lot of stuff in the world, but we are not doing what we are created for. That's gola because it's not transparent to us. The gula means we're doing the same thing, but our purpose in this world is transparent. But even more than that, the idea of the, of the, of the divine is more transparent to us in the time of Gula, in the time of redemption, versus in our time today. And here is something very important: that as we get closer to the time of Mashiach, you know, time has passed; thousands of years have passed since the prophecies of of, of the Messiah, of the Mashiach. As we get closer to the time of what we call the Messianic era, the Messianic redemption, that time that is very close to the Mashiach will be a fabulously di uh, a different time uh, than the times preceding it. So perhaps now we might argue, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at some data about how the world has become a much better place. Um, that this, we find ourselves in a time today where there's just a lot of good things happening in various, various areas of life. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. But let's go to the Rambam. Let's go to Maimonides. And let's see how he describes the Messianic era. And then we will know if we are close to the Messianic era, yes or no. We'll find out. Text number two, page number four. Here we go. In that era, there will be no famine or war, no envy or competition, for goodness will be in abundance, and all delights will be as commonplace as dust. That's an amazing prediction. The Rambam is predicting that when the Mashiach comes, when the Messiah arrives, pretty much the world will be a perfect place. And some people are thinking, yeah, that's wishful, wishful thinking. I remember when I was uh, uh, about nine years old, uh, it was the first time that our family went to Israel because um, my grandparents, my mother's parents had moved to Israel at that time. They were living in South America. And my grandfather retired, I think it was in 1969, and he moved to Israel. So in 1976, I was nine years old, or 1975, I believe. We went to Israel, and uh, it was my first time in Israel. Anyhow, I remember my grandfather, he was, my grandfather loved to play chess. And uh, his friends would come over to him, he'd go over to, to, to them. He was a very serious chess player. And this you know, group of men were playing chess at my grandfather's apartment. So one of the men sort of started to make small talk with me. He said, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. And he's speaking to me in Yiddish because he was, a, he was from Poland and he grew up in, in a Hasidic home, so he knew Yiddish. And my Hebrew wasn't that fluent and English he certainly didn't know. So Yiddish was the common language that we knew. So he says to me, you're nine years old. Oh, wow. Um, you know, we're in a few years, you're going to be bar mitzvah. I'll never forget. He says, you're going to be bar mitzvah in a few years. I said, of course. He says, where's your bar mitzvah going to be? So I said, of course, in Israel. He says, why is that? If you live in America, why is it going to be in Israel? And I'll never forget. I said to him, and I said it to him with all sincerity. I said, because the Mashiach will be here. By that time, the Messiah will have arrived. So where else would a Jewish kid have his bar mitzvah? And I'll never forget. He put his hands on my shoulders and he says, Young boy, young man, when I was your age, I too believed that my bar mitzvah uh, would be in Israel with the coming of Mashiach. And look, and look. And I remember I was like kind of surprised, not even disappointed. I was surprised that he had that position, you know, that he, he's older and he's having problems with the belief in the Mashiach. Well, I was nine years old. I guess didn't have much experience in life. So it was very easy as an innocent young child to say, it's not even a question in, in my mind. But when you become older, 
that becomes more difficult. And perhaps that's why we have to learn these kind of things. So when we see the world today, it, its state today, in what's going on in the world today, we have to ask ourselves, are we close to the vision that the Rambam describes what will be when Mashiach comes? You know, the idea that there will be no famine and no war. That means we will have eradicated poverty for good. We will have eradicated war for good. Envy, competition, we're just gonna be nice to each other every single day, every single moment of, of our lives. That's, that's a big prediction to make. But the Rambam didn't make, uh, make this uh, summarization of the era of Mashiach. It's not his idea. He didn't just, you know, concoct the idea, you know, tried to bring hope to people, but it was just, you know, a man-made idea. He based it on the prophecies from the generation, uh, the generations way before his times, you know, about a thousand years before he lived, those prophecies were prophesied by the great prophets. So let's visit some of those prophecies. Let's go to page number five, and we're going to read on uh, text number three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're going to read a lot of uh, 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 the prophecies in which Maimonides uses to make the proclamation about the perfection of our world when Mashiach comes. Here is text number three. And this comes from the book of Zechariah, Zechariah, as we call it in Hebrew. And he writes like this. On that day, there will no longer be an, an impoverished person in the house of God. So Zechariah, who's prophesizing, we believe is a prophet from God. He's saying the word of God. He's proclaiming that when the Mashiach comes, there will not be one impoverished person. All pover poverty will have been eradicated. You know, seems impossible because there's always going to be poor people. But when the Mashiach comes, that will be the state of affairs in our world. Four, text number four. This is about plenty, plentiful food. God will give rain for your seed with which you shall sow the soil. He will give you plentiful bread, the yield of the land, and the land will be rich and abundant. That's a very, very serious proclamation or a serious prediction. It's not a prediction, it's a prophecy. It's a very serious prophecy that there will be no hunger in the world. There'll be plenty of food for everybody. How many thousands of people have died from hunger throughout hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people have died from hunger throughout thousands of years? Text number five is about disabilities being that will be vanished. Here's what, here's what Isaiah writes. At that time, the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf will be unstopped. Sounds like a crazy idea. There will be no more blindness and no more deafness. At that time, the lame shall skip like a deer and the tongue of the mute shall sing. So it's also another bold prophecy. And text number six, the cessation of hostilities, no more war. Nation shall not lift a, a sword against nation, nor shall anyone train for war anymore. People say, you know, what else is no, no war? war is, there's war all the time. And here's another one, an interesting one, disarmament. Nations shall beat their swords into plow blades and their spears into pruning to tools. And like people say, come on, <laughs> we're gonna use our ammunition, our weapons for all these good things. People are using their weapons for really, really bad stuff every single day of, of the year. So clearly, uh, these oh, and, oh, oh, the final one, number eight, elimination of crime. No longer will violence be heard in your land, nor robbery or devastation within your borders. You know, so some people can say, come on, open the newspaper, you know, open your, uh, uh, your news online, and it's inundated with crime, uh, cities that are crime ridden, and people are committing terrible crimes. So clearly, these texts indicate that Judaism believes that many of society's problems and ills are not permanent. So war, poverty, hunger and famine, crime, illness, disease and disabilities, the prophets reassured us that these unfortunate realities will not last forever. They'll be gone. There'll be a day that it will totally be uh, out of our here. We won't have to deal with it any longer. You know, so how outlandish and how far-fetched are these prophecies that we just read? If those prophecies are prophesizing something that's so enormous, how far-fetched is it? How outlandish is it? So to answer these questions, in order to see if it's really far-fetched, to really see if it's an outlandish prophecy, um, we're going to have to contrast the messianic era, the way the prophets have described it, to the times that we are living today, and see maybe 
there's some kind of correlation. Maybe we are in line. Maybe we are in the path towards that redemption. So we're going to make an attempt to evaluate the current state of our world and the wider trends of, of key quality of life areas. So we're going to look at life as we see it today. We can only speak about things that are going on today and see, are we closer to the description of the prophecies or, God forbid, we are actually further away. So let's, we're going to talk about that. But before we do that, I'd like you to ask, do a little survey over here. Uh, it's on page number uh, eight in your book. So here is a question that I'd like to ask everybody. How would you rate the state of the, our world today compared to its state of 50 years ago? Have conditions generally improved or deteriorated? In the last 50 years, I'm not asking you to go back to the 1300s. I'm asking you to rate the condition of our world. How do we compare our world in 2021 versus the world the way it was in the 1960s? Would you say, A, it's greatly improved, B, somewhat improved, the, switch, the situation is more or less the same, that would be C, D, somewhat deteriorated, or E, greatly deteriorated. Um, if anybody wants to post, if you know how to use the chat, you can post it there and say, let me know if it's A, greatly improved, or just give me, if you don't have the book in front of you, um, or if you want to unmute yourself, if anybody want to, wants to take this question and respond to this. Anybody? Any, any brave volunteers? I think, uh, I think it's Max who's unmuting himself. Yes, I, I would say... Um... You want me to give you the choices? Yeah, can, can, can you hear me, Max? Not sure why I can't hear him. Hello. It's, yeah, you can, can you hear me? me? Hello. Sorry. Can you, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. Oh, OK. Yeah, Max, yeah, what I were you saying? You. All right, I, we said, you. Uh, I forget exactly which letter it is, but I would say it's the same. OK. And I say that because there are certain areas where things have improved and certain areas where things have declined. So in the aggregate, it's, it's, it's sort of evened out. Right. Makes. So yeah, you're basically saying the situation is more or less the same. That would be uh, C. All right, yeah. uh, let's ask the second question. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Max, you know, take, take this question, unmute yourself. Uh, Are you uh, very optimistic, somewhat optimistic, somewhat pessimistic, very pessimistic? I would say I'm somewhat optimistic. Somewhat optimistic, okay. Not bad, not bad. Um, now, Answers will vary. It really depends who you are, how old you are, what, um, what you went through in your own life. There are various different answers. Um, the attitude in contemporary, contemporary society in general, okay, obviously there's always the exception. And then we, you can have large minority groups of people thinking a different way. But the general consensus in our contemporary society is that many of us um, or many people believe that life used to be better than it is today for various different reasons. And in fact, people will say, you ever hear people say, oh, our parents had it better than we do. They, their lives were much better. Or our children, it's the opposite. Or people say our children are worse off than we are. Some people say that. Um, and even if you look at a survey that was conducted in England in 2017, you can look it up online. So they took a, a survey, and this is in 2017, so it's just a couple of years ago. And they, uh, they sur in other words, this is a survey, survey of 26,489 people. So it's a big survey that really can, can be very telling, you know, can, can be scientific as, as we call it. So they had 26, over 26,000 people across 28 countries surveying the, resp the respondents' perceptions of the state of the world. So they asked them various different que questions about the state of the world, all right? And here is one of the questions that they asked. And they asked them about global poverty. They wanted to know what did people believe about global poverty? And this is what they asked them. If you look at page 10 in figure 1.2, this is the question. Survey question. In the last 20 years, has the, pro has the proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty has decreased, increased, or remained the same. 
And here is the interesting answer. They said the following, 20% uh, said it decreased, all right? 28% said it remained the same, but here's the kicker. 52% of people believed that the world's uh, the global poverty has increased in, 27, in the year 2017 versus 20 years before that. So their perception, their belief is that more people are living in poverty throughout the entire world than they are today. So you can see half of the people believe that, right? Here's another one. The same question was asked about crime. So they want to know about crime. And they asked them, here's the survey question. Is there more, and this is in the United States, is there more crime in the United States than there was a year ago or less? And you can go from 1989, you can see the, the, the chart here, from 1989 through 2020, they asked the people the same question. Was crime more or less or the same or no opinion from the previous year? If you look closely, only four times, I believe it's four times, you can correct me if you, you, you count it up later on, but I believe it's, it's about four or five times that people said that this year there was less crime than the year before. One of the ones I see is 2001. There are 43% of, of, of people said there was less crime versus 41% who said there was more crime. And that was the year of 9-11. So it's an interesting year. Um, I, I'm not sure what, if there's a correlation. It's just something that comes into my own mind. But if you look at most of the years, look at 2020, people, 78% of people said there were more crime versus 14% who said there, were, there was less crime. So this is very important for us to understand that people do not see the world as progressing into a better state. They actually believe, at least in crime and in poverty, the world has become a worse place than before. And quickly, here's one more, one more survey here. Just, you know, I don't wanna drive you guys crazy with surveys, but it's important for us to understand what the perception of people today, contemporary people today believe. Here's another survey where people were not too optimistic about our future. Here's survey, the survey question on page 12. All things considered, do you think the world is getting better, worse, or neither getting better nor worse? And the bottom line is that um, there's clearly 30% believe that neither getting better or, or worse. But here's the big one. 58% of people believe that the world is becoming a worse place. It's an interesting thing. And, and there are probably reasons, but it's not for us to discuss why people have that perception. So there's clearly a widespread sentiment that things today are a lot worse than they were in the good old days. So people today are not feeling that good about the state of affairs in the whole of this world. So what happens when a person has that feeling that the world is just not that great? It brings on anxiety, stress, hopelessness, negative emotions, you know, that make us feel lousy. You know, you wake up in the morning, you say, oh my gosh, there's so much crime, there's so much poverty, famine, war, so on and so forth. You're not going to feel really good about it. That's why maybe uh, tune out uh, <laughs> with news and, 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 and your, uh, your phone. I'll talk about it at the, uh, later, a little later on. But I have fantastic news for everybody. If you got depressed based on the ideas, the stats that we were speaking a moment ago, it's true, yes. Many people believe that the world is spiraling out of control, but that does not make it true. People can believe a lot of things if, if they want, and they could be, you know, a majority of the people, but it doesn't make it factual, and it's not what makes it true. So now we're going to delve into what exactly is the truth. Tell us the truth about what's really going on in our world. Um, is the present world truly worse than, than, than the past? Are we really in a worse place than we were before? Is the state of the world steadily declining? Is that what's really going on over here? So this is what we're going to try to address today in this in today's lesson, the state of affairs in this world. Now, the Torah, which gives us a path in life, it's the blueprint of our lives, and it also gives us an attitude about the world. So if you look at the Torah, starting from the times of Abraham, he's the first Jew, we'll start from there. The world is marching towards a better destiny. God is always asking Abraham to make this world a better place. In fact, uh, just to give a quick example, look at Abraham, his attitudes towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were the worst of, of the people. They deserved to, to have a, a, a total destruction of, 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 of their cities. Yet Abraham 
stands up for them. He believes there's hope. He believes that we their destiny could be a better one where there's there's good goodness within themselves. So the redemption will not be a sudden transition from complete darkness to light. It's not like the world world is going uh, to hell in a handbasket, and all of a sudden this Mashiach declares himself the Messiah and ushers in the world into this peaceful and prosperous um, uh, era. That's not what's going to happen. It's going to be a gradual uh, transition. There's going to be more and more goodness. The world will become a better place until it finally ultimately leads into a state where we can call it the Messianic era. So in this next section, pretty much for the rest of the lesson, we are going to take the time uh, to look at some of the data that might lead us to see that the messianic prophecies are beginning to materialize. And that's the argument that we're going to be making today, that perhaps we are living in a time, if you just look at the real data, not what people feel, not their sentiments, not their beliefs, um, not how they feel, but what's really going on on the ground in the state of affairs of the world globally. It's possible to argue, there's room to argue that we are in the process of the messianic, the, trans, uh, the process of transition into the messianic era. All right, so before we get into the, 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 the data, I just wanna point out something very beautiful, a, a nice observation about transitioning and getting, in, getting close to that time. Um, many of you have been to my house for Shabbat, Friday night dinners, and the Friday night dinners don't just come out of a vacuum. They don't just appear on the tables. Uh, usually Rachi, and uh, sometimes my, my daughters and sometimes other help, we prepare for Shabbat. And one of the things I love to do every Friday is to go into the kitchen about 12, one o'clock when the food is already starting to get ready. And I'll take a piece of the kugel, you know, that potato kugel or a piece of the chicken. And it's right, it's, it's hot, fresh out of the oven and it just tastes delicious. Now I'm not eating a full fledged Shabbat meal, but let me tell you, it's delicious stuff. So when I eat that piece of kugel, when I eat that uh, piece of chicken, what am I tasting? I'm tasting a semblance of what Shabbat is gonna be about. I'm not even talking about the spirituality of the Shabbat. I'm talking about what I'm gonna eat that night and perhaps the next day. So you're getting a taste of what it's like to celebrate the Shabbat on Friday afternoon. So the Rebbe uh, you know, quotes from the Talmud, that just like we eat before Shabbat to get a taste of what Shabbat will be, a, will, will, will be all about, to get excited about the Shabbat, before the Messianic redemption, before the Mashiach comes, we are going to get a taste of the prophecies from the great prophets of the previous generations. All those prophecies of a, of, of a utopian world where there'll be no more war and the, and, and the weapons will be transformed into, in, into plowshares and where there'll be no more poverty and no more famine and so on and so forth. We're gonna get a taste of that. And that's what we mean when we transition. So we're gonna skip uh, text number nine just to, to save some time for, for, for the class, but you can read it, it's a nice idea. Um, and indeed, we are already seeing a host of sweeping positive societal changes. In many ways, today is, that's not my opinion, I, I really, I mean, it is my opinion, but I think people can agree with it that today is the best time ever to be alive for various different reasons. I know we have problems, but that's because Mashiach hasn't come. But we are seeing, we are feeling the prophecies actually unfolding itself. So I'm not speaking about, you know, so when we compare our world to you know, to, 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 when, when I talk about comparing our world today, the state of affairs today, I'm not just comparing it to, uh, to the dark ages in the 1300s, the 14th century. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you compare our state of affairs from today to the early, to 1990, to 20 years ago, things have changed dramatically. So that's what we're going to talk about over here. Um, there's never been a safer healthier and wealthier and more comfortable time in all of history like we have it today. And even if we compared it to 30 years ago, we can make this claim 
based on the ideas that we're going to talk about. So we're just going to talk about data right now. So if you're an engineer, a scientist, and you like data, this is it. It's not going to be boring data. I'm just going to summarize the ideas here. All right, let's begin with the data on poverty. So we spoke about Zechariah. Zechariah made a prophecy, a very bold prophecy, that we're going to eradicate poverty for good, for all eternity. There will be no more poor people, okay? Um, so here are the facts. Um, decades ago, if you told someone that we could eradicate poverty in a serious way, bring poverty down to a level where it almost is non-existent, that would be lunacy. It, it would, they would say it's impossible to do it. But thank God, Baruch Hashem, as we say in Hebrew, we are blessed to live in a time in a world where the conversation it's a real thing. It's no more lunacy. We're having a conversation about eradicating extreme poverty. In America, we have poor people. And by the way, poverty, poor people in America, poverty in America or in other Western civilizations is not necessarily an objective way of, of looking at poverty. Everybody in, in, in America, um, you don't want to say everybody, most of us, almost everybody is way wealthier than people outside of America. So here is a, a graph that we should look at. Page number uh, 15, figure 1.5. If you look at the global popu population suffering from extreme poverty, it went from 90% in 1820, not that long ago, to around 10% in 2015. Look at the graph. So if you, see, you look at the graph in 1820, you're looking at almost, it's not at 90, but it's certainly over 80%. And now we're holding 10%. Now, under about 10 percent i just want to um define what extreme poverty is and that the way you define it is the only ones who define it is the world bank so you and i can argue from today till tomorrow but we're going to use the definition by the world bank if you earn less than one dollar and 90 cents per day right that is extreme poverty so in 1820 people earning the equivalent of that amount obviously you have to account for inflation you were at 90% level. That means 90% of people in the world, almost 90%, were earning that amount of money. You can't live that way. Today, we've almost eradicated it. It's down to about 10%. That's a very, very big deal. Another idea uh, uh, to show the incredible advancements that have been made in recent decades between 1981 and 2017. World population living in extreme poverty from 1981 to 27 went down from 40% to almost 10%. Just, so it's not 1820, we're talking about 1981, not that long ago, all right? So many of us remember 1981. Here is a, a, an interesting text that I'd, I'd like to read with you on page number 17, and it's about poverty. What's going on in the state of affairs in this world about poverty? Let's turn to page number 17, text number 10. Here it goes. If you're depressed by the state of the world, let me toss out an idea. In the long arc of human history, 2019 has been the best year ever. As re recently as 1981, 42% of the planet's population endured extreme poverty defined by the United Nations as living on less than about $2 a day. The portion has plunged to less than 10% of the world's population now, which at that time was 2019, not too long ago. Every day for a decade, newspapers could have carried the headline, Another 170,000 moved out of extreme poverty yesterday. That could have been the headlines. It wouldn't sell a lot of papers, but it would have been a headline. Or if one uses a higher threshold, the headline could have read or have been the number of people living on more than $10 a day increased by 245,000 yesterday. Those are incredible numbers where we've gone from 1981 at 43% down to about 10% in 2019, which is about today, all right? So that just shows you that the prophecy of Zechariah is not that far-fetched any longer. It's no longer lunacy. A hundred years ago, that was lunacy. Even in 1981, that would have been a crazy idea. I want to wish a mazel tov to Bill and Melinda Gates. They are getting divorced. Did you know that? It was on the news yesterday. And the reason I'm wishing them a mazel tov is because we're going to quote them both over here. And here is text number 11. I'm just kidding about it about the mazel tov. But um, I'm trying to grab your attention. 
page 18, here is what they said, you know, their word, you know, they're working to um, uh, reduce um, poverty, you know, in these far-flung countries, in, in Africa, I think specifically. And this is what they say. This huge drop in the number of people living on less than $1.90 per day is among the most unappreciated and most important developments of our generation. So we could envision a day now that we're at the 10% threshold, perhaps, perhaps we're looking at the era of Mashiach right before us. It's a very, very beautiful idea. Another thing about poverty, speaking about money, even from 1960 to 2019, I know people are always complaining, inflation, things are getting more expensive, but we have more disposable income today than any in any other generation, which means like this, in 1960, most of your money was spent on essentials. You had to buy food, you had to buy medicine, you had to buy a, you know, a roof over your head. Today, on the other hand, you because things have become cheaper and perhaps people are earning more money, we have more disposable income than we ever had before. You know, you, I can ask you guys a question. You know, how does the size of your house compare to your parents' home? Now, is, you know, a lot of us can say our parents' homes were, were, were smaller or your wardrobe. Whose wardrobe was bigger? Not for men. You know, the, the, the men in this group, our wardrobes are not too big. But women, ask yourselves, whose wardrobe was bigger? Your mom's or yours? So that just shows us that poverty is being eradicated. Have we come to the level that Zechariah prophesied? Absolutely not. And we have to work on that as well. All right. So we're not going to be satisfied until the Mashiach comes, I guess. Let's talk about famine and abundance. That's about a famine. If you look at the Torah, it's inundated with stories of famine. So if you look at the story of Abraham, if you look at the story of Isaac, of Jacob, King David, they all have stories about famines. And it was difficult. Um, ask anybody today, did you ever live through a famine? No, there is there's no such thing as a famine today. And by the way, in Africa, the reason there are famines and starvations there is that's because of war. That's because of dictators and bad people taking away the food, but the food is actually there. We're, we have enough food for, for, for a very, very long time. And even people who made the accusation of overpopulation, it's not true. We can have many, many more people and we have enough food. There's food in abundance for everybody. Now, if you look at food was prepared you know, 500 years ago, um, you can only feed the people in your immediate surroundings. You couldn't transport food from your town, from your city, and ship it over to people who are living 100 miles away or 500 miles away. Today, you go to Costco and you find items that are perishable, you know, refrigerated items, cheeses. Uh, uh, at Costco, you find you, uh, Teva, it's called uh, Tanuva, sorry, it's called Tanuva. Tanuva is, a, is, the, is the dairy uh, factory uh, manufacturers of, of all the dairy products in Israel. They're the biggest one, there's others. But you can get it at Costco, which means that it's on a ship or a, or a plane and you buy it, it's fresh, it's refrigerated, it didn't get spoiled. We have the means of, of preserving food in a fantastic way. So the idea that, there's, uh, um, that there are no famines today puts us back to the prophecy of Isaiah, where we're eliminating famine, we are have, we're eliminating starvation. And if you look clearly at on page number 19, global annual rate of people dying due to famine per 100,000. If you look at uh, the 1870s, 150 people, almost 100, 142 people of 100,000 people died from that. Look at today, almost nobody is dying. I mean, people are dying, but, but it's minuscule. It's very, very few people. So today, Baruch Hashem, because of technology and science and improved farming practices, we can do a lot about uh, uh, feeding people throughout the entire universe. You know, God forbid, uh, earthquake happens, a uh, storm happens, um, tsunami happens, we can bring food to people very, very quickly and very, very efficiently. Um, same thing with clean water. You know, today, uh, 305,000 people are gaining access to clean water for the first time every single day. So that's, that's not anything to sneeze at. All right, let's talk about another thing, life lifespan. That means people will, will, will live for longer periods of time. Um, you know, we see it clearly. People are living to 100 years old. It's an amazing thing. The average human life, if you look at page 21, the data there, the average human life in 1800 was about 30 years old. It's crazy, 30 years old. So if you're 20, 25, you're an old man. Max, you're an old man in 1800. 
in 2015. Crazy. Huh? That's crazy. It, it's totally crazy. In 2015, we hit around 70 years old. And, and we know people are living way older than 70. 70 year olds are getting jobs. I saw a beautiful story of 70 year old guy uh, getting a job at um, was a Postmates, you know, one of these or Domino's pizza. It's a whole story where he kept delivering and he's doing a really good job. He was actually 80 years old. He just didn't have money. The whole story was somebody made a GoFundMe um, um, uh, fundraiser for the guy and, you know, help him to retire properly. Why shouldn't an 80 year old man be delivering pizzas in the cold winter? So, so the point is that we have longevity in a way that we did not have. We did not have um, even child mortality. And child mort mortality is kids that are under five years old who die. And those are the children that die the most between birth and five years old. That, those rates are coming down in a very, very significant, uh, significant way. And the reasons for that is because of the decline of war, which we'll speak about in a min minute, and, and decline of violence, believe it or not, and wider availability of food. Um, and most, of, most importantly, the advancements of medicine is making us and allowing us to live for much longer periods of time. Um, if you look at if you look at illnesses and uh, 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 specifically, ask people today: Has anybody ever met anybody with smallpox? Nobody's that old to, to to know that it's eradicated. Polio, okay, maybe a few people older could remember that. Rabies, syphilis, all these th these things are gone. And then there are there's reduced. If you look at this on page twenty two, there are illnesses that are reduced. It's malaria. When was the last time you heard somebody who had mal malaria? It can happen, but it's very rare. Diabetes, AIDS, those are manageable things. But nevertheless, people are longing, living longer than ever before. So things are not that bad. Um, if you look at disabilities, I'm going to go very quickly. There are, there are a lot of interesting things about disability. So with, we spoke about in the prophecies, he, he, in, in, the, in the prophets, he uh, delineated four specific things, blindness, deafness, lameness, and muteness. All of those things, we have tremendous amounts of uh, progress. If you look at uh, the idea of, of blindness, we have eyeglasses, which is, you know, that's not new. Uh, cataract surgery, I don't know how, how, how old that is, but maybe a hundred years ago, you went blind if you didn't have, a, a, if you had a cataract situation. Corneal transplants, so people can see now. How about LASIK surgery? Get rid of the glasses. Um, there are tremendous amounts of breakthroughs in helping people to be able to see people without uh, these chips that are putting their brain they could not see, and today they're able to see. You can read number 13, and you'll see that. Same thing, the deaf will hear. There's a, a, an unbelievable treatment or an unbelievable surgery where they implant a chip, hearing aids. It's called cochlear, cochlear implant. That's becoming famous. I think 600,000 people have already done it. Now they could hear. I'm not mistaken. I think Rush Limbaugh is one of those people. I think so, but maybe I'm wrong. Finally, the mute will speak. You know, We have also technology. Uh, on page 24, you'll see uh, headlines of different papers. Uh, brain implant allows mute man to speak. So that comes to show us that even when it comes to healing people, we might be living in a time where we could say, you know what? Those prophecies where we're going to heal people is not that, not that outlandish. It's not lunacy to say we can we can. We can, uh, uh, we, we can bring about the healing of all of these people. We're not there completely, but now we can speak about saying, you know, those prophecies were not so crazy as one might have thought maybe a hundred years ago. Let's talk about um, war and peace. Um, war and peace is interesting because in our century, in the, you know, the one we lived in, in the 20th century, we saw terrible amounts of bloodshed. Uh, we saw two world wars and we saw communism, how how millions have been destroyed by Stalin and, 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 and May, Mayo and, and all, all of these, um, Mao and all of these uh, terrible tyrants who, who killed off their own people, millions of them. We could see that, it, it, it look at figure number 1.11 on page 25, clearly from after World War II. So from after 1945 until 2015, which is our time today, we significantly decrease the amount of people who die by war. Very few people die because of war. Of course, you have a war here and there. And if you look today, there are less wars happening on this planet than ever than any time before. You know, years ago, they used to honor um, the you know the uh, what are they the, the knights, the 
the guys who would go out uh, to warfare, the fighters, the warriors, you know, they were celebrated and there was special, uh, they put, were put on, you know, some special place in, in, in life for these warriors. Today, what is the attitude, the attitude of life? Nobody wants a war. Anytime America even thinks about it, having a war and America is already making a protest. It's a good thing. People don't want to get into war. Um, so today, attitude towards war is very, very uh, different. Um, text number four gives a little bit, so we're going to skip that. Um, so this too is, is another indication of a clear prophecy that proclaims that war will end. Uh, talk about weapons. You know, and years ago, they used to have spears and arrows and knives, and you know, you killed off a few people. You know, how, much, how many people could, could you kill, kill with a spear? You have to have one, a second one. It's all, it's all manual. You couldn't kill that many people. But nevertheless, it existed. But then we went to rifles and cannons and artillery. And now we have fighter planes and tanks and, in, and intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, systems and, and, and nuclear bombs. And we used the nuclear bomb in, in, in Japan, in Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. Um, during the Cold War, think about it. What was the proliferation of, of nuclear, nuclear arms? It was insane. It was, it was totally out of control. But Baruch Hashem, today, the Cold War is over and we've dismantled most of the nuclear arms between the United States and Russia are gone. So this, per, this perhaps is a beautiful indication that we're getting closer, but here's something very important. So we have militaries. Most of, I don't know most, but a lot of our militaries um, uh, uh, resources are used actually to save people's lives, not to destroy people's lives. You remember in 2018, it was a beautiful story. I, I remember just uh, you know, watching it and I think, everybody was, was, was really into it, where these group of uh, kids who were on a soccer team and they were on some hike and they were in a cave and they got stuck. There was some storm that they rushed the water in and they got stuck there for many, many weeks. And finally they were rescued. Who were they rescued by? The military, by the Thailand military. When, uh, you know, the tsunamis in Indonesia, you had the United States military come and save people. Um, COVID relief, that's done by, was actually originally done by the military. People don't realize that, but even China, China is trying to make clean their environment. And they're using, I believe, 60,000 soldiers in text number 15. It's not a made up thing. I'm, I'm not absolving China from all the terrible things. It's not a political thing. But they are using military resources to better the world to saving lives. And finally, let's get to the idea of, of, uh, of violence. So violence, you know, the perception is it's getting bad. Look, every one of us has a smartphone. You open your smartphone, you're, you're opening up your Google News and you're opening up your Yahoo and what, all the other media you're, you're, and, and, and social media. What are people talking about? They're not talking about how someone brought, brought a, a, a pumpkin pie to their neighbor. It's not going to happen. You're, it, it's, not, it's not newsworthy you know, to, to, to make money off that. So you have to tell us about all the violence. So the perception, it's not fact, it's not truth, but the perception of people is, oh my gosh, this country is going down in a handbasket. Is totally destroyed. There is violence. But if you look at violence, the amount of people that were killed by, by uh, the homicide, homicide rates across Western Europe, this is a, 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 I'm, I'm mentioning Europe because that's where the graph is on page number 29. You will see it's drastically down. Much fewer people today are, are killed by homicides compared to the way it was years ago. At the end of the day, it's really feelings versus facts. So I want to read text number 16 as we come to an end here. In 2019, according to the survey conducted by the Gallup, about 64% of Americans believe that there was more crime in the U.S. than there were, was a year ago. It's a belief we've consistently held for decades now. But as you can see in the chart below, we've been just as consistently very, very wrong. So you read those numbers, and you'll see clearly crime rates do fluctuate from year to year. It's never the same. In 2020, for example, murder has been up, but other crimes are in decline, so that the crime rate overall is down. And the trend line for violent crime over the last 30 years has been down, not up. So a lot of people are thinking it's getting worse, but it is actually down. That's what the numbers tell us. The Bureau of Justice Statistics found that the state of violent crimes per 1,000 Americans ages 12 and older plummeted from 80 in 1993 to 23 in 2018. The country has gotten much, much safer, but somehow Americans don't seem to feel that on a knee-jerk emotional level. The biggest challenge really, and we're seeing this, is 
a society across the board right now is that even though our organizations, our businesses, our government entities are becoming more data-driven, we as human beings are not, said Megan Hollis, a research scholar at the Ronan Institute for Independent Scholarship. So even though we are seeing things uh, at, at like in the worst possible way, ultimately, it's not the truth. If you look at the numbers, it's in, you know, if, if people are going to be committed to looking at truth of numbers, you will clearly see that uh, the numbers are telling us that we're becoming, uh, the crime, violent crime is actually going down. I just want, before we end the lesson, we're five minutes uh, um, uh, behind schedule here, but if you look at this, I'd like to ask anybody to unmute themselves. I want you to look at this uh, picture here, and I want you to tell me what you see in this picture. If anybody can unmute themselves, I would appreciate that. Tell me what you see. Any, any volunteers? Well, well yeah, based okay. on the discussion and what you're talking about, I see a beautiful set of mosaic tiles with this very pretty uh, pale blue aquamarine kind of color. Right. <laughs> Thank well, you uh, for you, the you, lesson. You got the point, so I think I got the you, point. <laughs> but what you, what most people will say, let's say I did not give this lesson. What most people will say is, I see the missing tile. All right, so that's called the missing tile syndrome. The reason we perceive things is because we only see the bad things. So if let's say you walked on your street and you see a robbery taking place, you're going to say, Oh my goodness, I got to leave this neighborhood. I got to move out of this block. But what you did, so that's because you saw the missing tile. So you're now suffering from missing tile syndrome. You did not hear about all the good things that one neighbor did to their other neighbor. That was the point of showing you this uh, tile. So it's like a little gimmick, but it really isn't a gimmick. And I, I, wanna, I wanna make this little uh, recommendation and I'm speaking to myself, to be honest with you. And you can listen in as I talk to myself. You know, I like to talk to myself sometimes. And that is that maybe we should use our phones a little less, you know, why is it that every five minutes we have to pick it up and see what's happening? You know, pretty much in five minutes, not much has changed, probably from day to day, not much has changed. I know things seem to be moving fast, but not necessarily is that true. Um, also, you know, we probably have to stop watching the news and there are various different ways that we watch news these days, online, on TVs or whatever it might be, but you don't have to watch the news. It's not a mitzvah to watch the news, you know, unless there's some big emergency. So you'll feel much better about yourself. But here's a nice idea. Um, that I recommend. There is an app that I just learned about, believe it or not. Someone in our community mentioned it to me, a woman. She said to me, Rabbi, I'm so like disgusted about, you know, what people are discussing on social media and all the news and, and everything. And just a lot of hate out there, just a lot of um, divisiveness. This country is divided in a terrible, terrible way. They downloaded an app called Chabad Radio. It's an app. And on it, it has a consistent um, playing of different lectures, lectures, people talking about different ideas, very spiritual matters, mystical, um, Talmudic, philosophical, all Jewish ideas. And some of them are really enjoyable, some less enjoyable, some are boring. But I found myself using that and I played in my car instead of listening to the talk show, talk shows. And when you listen to it, your life is more uplifted. It's good for your soul. It's good for your heart. It's good for your mind. It's good for every part of yourself. You'll be a much more positive person. It'll take away your anxiety. And I couldn't believe it. It made my life much better. I'm not saying that every lecture on it you'll, you'll connect with and you'll think it's great, but at least give yourself a, 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 some more time in, in your day to listen to better things and get away from missing tile syndrome. So that is the lesson for today. It was a very data-driven uh, lesson. And that was purposely done so that we could first understand that we are very close and in line with the prophets' um, prophecies that it's not lunacy. We're getting there. We're not, it's, we, we haven't perfected it yet. Um, God willing, next week, we're going to take a little turn and we're going to deal with more spiritual matters, more mystical matters to talk about the Mashiach. And I hope, we'll, I hope you'll join us uh, for next week. And um, I hope you enjoyed the, the lesson today. So what we'll do now is if anybody has any questions or comments or uh, compliments or complaints, now would be a great time to, uh, to, to do that. If anybody wants to do it, now is your, now is your chance. 
I'm ready for any questions or or comments. Very helpful, Rabbi. Yeah. I uh, wasn't sure, uh, as you know, uh, about uh, the topic, but I think this is good. Uh, the affirmations, the memes, the thoughts, the directions to go, what to look for. This can be very helpful. So thank you. And I really appreciate that that you, you came, uh, Ted, and, and uh, um, I, I know that uh, you weren't sure about it, but uh, I'm really glad that you came today. Me That's too. To thank me. you. All right, Todd. Oh, thank you for your efforts. No, and I, and I appreciate that, uh, that you came. All righty. So listen, I want to wish everybody a fantastic day, a positive day. Just know that you're living in the best of times. Knowing that it's it's just fantastic. And hopefully um, I'll see you guys next week. Hopefully. And uh, stay healthy. Thanks. All righty. Thank you, Rabbi. All righty. All right, Rabbi. You Thank Take you so care. much. Okay. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.